Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Joanne Palchuk for Mr. Jenkins and Mamie Wise, my co-counsel. Good morning. We're before the Court today in, a, um, in a, a, an appeal of the denial of a motion to vacate by, by the Honorable Judge Benke. There, we put forth at an evidentiary hearing that the newly discovered evidence probably... Ms. Palchuk, see if you can bring the microphone a little closer or if you can raise your voice a little bit. Is that better, Judge? Yes. There are two issues before the court today. Was the newly discovered evidence of such a nature that it would probably have led to an acquittal? Oh, and, and actually, there were there there is actually a three pronged in the Jones analysis that, that was the evidence would the evidence have been that, um, discoverable through dil due diligence of counsel at the time? The the state has conceded that the DNA evidence was not discoverable at the time. Can the court still hear me? Sound a little better. I'm having a little trouble. It's, it's uh, I don't know, indistinct, I think is the word. <laughs> okay, I'll speak up a little louder. Is that a little better? Try that. Okay. Is this better? Yes. You can hear me now? Yes, we can okay. hear you now. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be funny, but actually it was. The state has conceded that the newly discovered evidence in terms of the DNA evidence was not available at the time of trial through diligence of counsel. The state has also conceded that it would be admissible. So what we have left is, would it probably have led to an acquittal? We put forth before the trial court that it would for various reasons. And, and that's the first issue. The second issue is that there's a, such a combination of of issues in this case that is actually a case of manifest injustice, which is an extraordinary thing, but it is. There are um, key suspects that were never investigated. In fact, someone who had actually threatened um, the victim in this case was never, uh, never questioned by police. When he was first asked about this case, it was in court by the prosecutor. It was never examined. Would the, would the court like me to provide a brief recitation of the facts? your argument so okay you this this case involves a, a, a brutal stabbing of a woman who was 23 years old she was pregnant she was involved at the time with a major league baseball player named Floyd Yeomans Mr. Yeomans had um, had, had they had lived together for a period of years um, they continued to see each other although Mr. Uh, Yeomans had actually married Ms. Jenkins had filed a paternity lawsuit against um, Mr. Yeomans, I'm sorry, Ms. Williams, the decedent, had filed a paternity lawsuit because she had been, she had bore one child by him. He wasn't paying child support. She filed a lawsuit against him. He made a statement two weeks prior to her being brutally stabbed that he would have her dead. He would never pay child support. He would have, he, if he had to pay someone to do it. When he made that statement, he was in the car uh, with two other African American men. That's critical because the state never investigated. Mr. Yeomans. That's part of the manifest injustice argument that I'll get to. The, the, what occurred, Mr. The, Mr. Jenkins, the defendant, um, had a much different story. He lived with his wife. He, um, was a, he worked at Johnson's Battery. Um, the, he had spent the day with his wife and, um, and, his, and his young child. And by the way, Mr. Jenkins was not the biological father of that child but he took care of that child. So Mr. Jenkins stands in stark contrast to Mr. Yeomans, just in terms of what the record supports of his personhood. And I'll get to that later because it, it, it is critical. Mr. Uh, Jenkins, uh, after spending the day with his wife and child, went out to a baseball game and some other events with some of his friends, came home at about 11.40 at night, 11, 11.40, between 11.45 and midnight, went in, said hello to his wife, heard some screams went out, uh, and, and by the way, um, this, this area of town is actually not, a, and it's in the record, is not a very safe area of town. There had been a number of crimes in the area. Heard screams, went out, didn't hear additional screams, came back in, continued to eat, and, that, and he did testify to this on the record. Heard additional screams, went out, went down into the parking lot and saw the star witness against him, who at the time was a convicted felon, Tony Waldron. Interestingly enough, Tony Waldron was only wearing shorts, no shirt, and no shoes. So m he and Mr. Jenkins go out and they look to see what, um, 
uh, this is the source of the screaming. Notably, it wasn't just the two of them that heard screaming. There was a downstairs neighbors of the decedent who heard screaming that was, first it was like an arguing between a married couple, and then it became high, high pitched. So there was three, there were actually three people that heard this, the screaming. When they go to investigate, uh, Mr. Waldron says that he saw a black male jump over the fence. Now, what's interesting about that is at that time, he didn't identify that black male as Mr. Jenkins, but he, but he said he saw a black male jump over the fence. So he and Mr. Jen Mr. Jenkins goes in the back to look for this black male. Doesn't find him, they continue on. They hear a baby screaming. Um, Mr. Jenkins is aware that there's a woman named Janet Williams who, has, who lives in an apartment down at the end. So he, they walk down and they find Ms. Williams on the steps of her landing of her upstairs apartment, bad, very um, uh, beaten and um, not able to speak at all. And they try to speak to her, she can't speak. Mr. They decide they should call the police. Mr. Jenkins doesn't have a telephone. Mr. Waldron goes uh, and, and goes back to his house and tells his wife to call the police. At that time, Mr. Waldron alleges that he then, he then hears a second scream and he alleges that he sees Mr. Jenkins on the steps with something shiny in his hand. Um, and then he comes back, they go down the stairs. Mr. Mr. Jenkins um, heard the baby cry and saw the baby walk out on the landing and goes up and actually gets the baby who was only in a night shirt, so he wrapped it in his shirt. The police come, they wait for the police, the police come, he gives the baby to the police. Um, actually, I'm sorry, he, did, he initially gives the baby to Mrs. To Mrs. Waldron who comes out. The, um, uh, there were significant pieces of evidence that were taken which are actually the newly discovered evidence that's before the court today. The victim, um, it was a brutal stabbing of 32 stab wounds and at the evidentiary hearing we had Dr. Michael Bodden come and talk about that this was a type of rage, a, a crime of passion. This wasn't, you know, just someone randomly going and stabbing someone. 32 stab wounds was a crime of passion. Uh, and he felt that there had been a sexual assault that occurred. Um, one, because the, the nature of the, of the forensics in the case, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, but, but also um, that the, the, the crime itself was a crime of familiarity, um, like a boy, he actually uses the term boyfriend uh, or, or lover of some type. Mr. Jenkins was none of that, but Mr. Yeomans was. And notably, Mr. Yeomans had a key to the apartment. There was no evidence of a break-in. Mr. Yeomans had a key. And, and there's also testimony in the record that, Mr., that Ms. Um, Jenkins, that Ms. Um, Williams, the decedent, was afraid of Mr. Uh, Yeomans. She wouldn't answer her door, um, and there's testimony, unless she could see who the person was. Now, what's, what was the newly discovered evidence for the uh, 3853? There were, um, first, I think critically, there were defensive wounds on the hand of, of the victim. The fingernail scrape, several defensive wounds, and there was testimony at trial about that, several slash wounds across, and, and again, it was a stabbing. Um, the scrapings from the fingernails were taken, and this court has always held the scrapings to be significant, particularly when, when there's an attack. Those fingernail scrapings entirely exclude Mr. Jenkins. There was um, the presence of semen or the product of semen in the vagina, uh, in the vaginal vault, that ex totally excludes Mr. Jenkins. There was um, uh, semen encrusted on the panties, excludes Mr. Jenkins. The state made, there wasn't a fingerprint of any kind. In fact, this is an entirely circumstantial and witness case, and I'll, g I'll get to the witness part in a minute, the problems with that. But the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the newly discovered DNA evidence would suggest. Ms. Uh, Ms. Paul, yes. let, let me ask a question yes. about that because it seems like what you're categorizing as newly discovered evidence at best shows that the, the victim had sexual intercourse, um, which you all have then argued um, equates to a sexual assault. Well, you know what? And that's actually part of the manifest injustice in this case, Judge Lucas. If you look at the testimony of the investigating officer, he said, I can't say that it did, 
or I can't say that it didn't. So then they didn't, they didn't, they did not investigate it as a sexual assault. And then they rely on that lack of investigation to say that it didn't happen, which is precisely the reason that I brought Dr. Bodden in to say, and, wh and by the way, why didn't they think it occurred? It was because the woman's panties were in place. I mean, that, that's, Dr. Bodden uh, gave clear testimony that in the, in the thousands of cases that he's looked at. I, I guess what, what, what I'm having a hard time understanding is um, how it goes from being evidence consistent with someone having had sexual intercourse to, um, to it being evidence of that being sexual assault. What you're telling me is, well, no one looked into it. What I'm asking is a little bit different is, well, but why, why would they have pursued that? What positive evidence, either newly discovered or originally in the record, suggests that it was anything more than or other than sexual intercourse. Okay. Well, first, the, the, the crime was brutal, and it went on inside the house. The screaming occurred in the bedroom. There was, and, and the reason we know that is because one of the rear windows was ajar, and there were um, stab wounds through the drapes of those windows, bloody stab wounds, where the blood was like, um, a hay, it had a halo effect. But that, that all occurred at the time of the murder, of the crime. The evidence wasn't. It, the evidence showed that the, the semen that was there had been there for a couple of days. No, no. Th that was never precise. I mean, that was an estimate that it could have been a couple of days, but it wasn't that it had been a couple of days. It could have been that. I mean, let's think about it. It's the semen is still in the vaginal vault, unless she's. I mean, not to be too graphic with the court, but unless she's laying in bed for three days straight, I can't imagine and not showering. I can't imagine that it would be, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not an expert about that, but it, it, it's, it's, rem, it's remarkable, it's remarkable that they didn't consider the prime suspect, which Dr. Bodden talked about. Look, when you, when you investigate a case that's this brutal, the first thing you do is a rape kit because that's your prime suspect. And, and even if it had been consensual sex, even if it had been consensual sex, which we don't concede, we take the position she was sexually assaulted, that's still someone who should have been investigated. That's, that's, that's part of the manifest injustice case, but there's other DNA. And, and, and actually, those, those types of questions can be kind of addressed in, in what Swafford calls the total picture. There was a, a potential rape that wasn't investigated. There was, um, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, a crime of passion. If they had looked into the, and even, even marginally looked into Floyd Yeomans, they would have discovered that there were two other people who heard him made that threat. What did he do after that? Who were those two people? Who were those two people? He said he would have her dead, and he told someone. And were these, were these all these points that you're, you're bringing up, were these brought up, whether or not the police investigated, but were these brought up at the original trial? Yes, they were. Yes, they were brought up at the original trial, but they weren't brought up in the context, and that's actually part of the issue we have with the lower court, that if you look at something in a vertical, okay, maybe um, uh, this was brought up and, and maybe she had consensual sex. If you look at it as a vertical, then you know maybe point by point, maybe this point alone, but the proper analysis under Hildwin and Swafford is the totality. The totality is there was, a, there was a person who threatened her. He wasn't investigated. He had access, motive, and means. He made an active threat. And, 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 and there's other DNA that, that goes to the total picture, Judge Lucas. There was the state made uh, a large part of their prosecution that there were no fingerprints because the, the um, uh, perpetrator used socks as gloves. Inside one of the socks were two apparent hairs. One was Miss Jenkins or any of her maternal relatives. The other was um, so entirely excluded. Uh, I'm sorry, one was Ms. Williams, the decedent, and all of her maternal relatives. The other totally excluded Mr. Jenkins. Was so someone DNA, else threw that sock. Was there any DNA testing uh, done in relation to Mr. Yeomans? No, we've to attempted to locate Mr. Yeomans. Interestingly enough, after this occurred, Mr. Yeomans' baseball um, uh, um, playing deteriorated significantly. 
he's kind of been off and on. I've, we've attempted to locate him, and, and we continue to do so. We thought. So the DNA evidence, other than what you've described, doesn't link up any third person, other than there is DNA out third, uh, one or more third persons. Well, right, and, and that's the other interesting thing. In Rachel Gottman's testimony, Mr. Dicker, who's the prosecutor, asked her, well, could you use this DNA to definitively match anyone at this point? And she said no. So if that is actually the case, then how can it be that it doesn't, that, that how can the, the small matches um, incriminate Mr. Jenkins? And Ms. Palchuk, you didn't indicate if you wish to reserve any time for Yes, I would like to reserve three now. minutes. Am I at the three minutes? Yes, th thank you, Judge Sylvian. You have a couple more minutes if you oh, like. I do have a couple more minutes. Yes, I do have some 15. more. I do. So uh, going back to the Jones prongs, is this DNA evidence of such a nature that it would probably lead to an acquittal? And under that is, would it create reasonable doubt? So let's think about it. This is a brutal attack. The woman had hair curlers. It's not as if that this was a gun where she was shot. This is a hand-to-hand -hand combat where the her cur curlers were pulled from her hair. So, they, so she was close enough to scratch her assailant, and, and, and trial testimony is that these are defensive wounds. If a jury had heard, well, there's defensive wounds on that hand, and by the way, the, the fingernail scrapings don't match Mr. Jenkins. Oh, and there's a bloody scene in the, ba in the bedroom you know, where she was screaming for her life, which connects back to Mona Case hearing a married couple. She characterized it as a married couple arguing that became hysterical. That's Mr. Yeomans. And it occurred in the bedroom. The, the, and you know, that's another very inconsistent thing that also gives rise to a little manifest injustice, that the detective, when he talked about that it was, um, that, that it was not investigated as a rape because her panties were in place, and as far as he was concerned, everything happened right there on the porch, that's just not supported in the record. And you, the argument can be made that that could have been pointed out at trial, but if it were, but if it were shown that, okay, she had relations, sexual relations, whether consensual or forced, we take the position they were forced, and it was definitively not Mr. Jenkins, then wouldn't the jury have a question of, okay, who is that guy? And when was he there? Because someone else was there, and it excludes Mr. Jenkins. So the critical- I'll cut you at the 17 minute mark if you yes. reserve your three. No, I've reserved my three, thank you. May it please the court, my name is Marilyn Becky and I represent the state of Florida. In 1990, Mr. Jenkins was convicted of armed burglary in the first degree murder of Jeanette Williams. This court affirmed his convictions and sentences and 25 years since he had filed multiple post-conviction pleadings, including a federal habeas corpus petition, all of which were denied. His latest collateral attack on his conviction and sentence came in the form of a 50, uh, 3853 motion for post-conviction DNA testing that was granted. After those uh, items were tested, the post-conviction court had a full evidentiary hearing where it was Mr. Jenkins' burden to show that the newly discovered evidence would probably produce an acquittal at retrial. Unfortunately for Mr. Jenkins, the DNA testing does nothing to weaken the state's case against him. In fact, it actually strengthens it. What was found on the DNA testing of the bloody sock that was found in the bag that Mr. Waldron testified Mr. Jenkins threw behind the lot was in addition to Ms. Jenkins, I'm sorry, Ms. Williams' blood DNA, which was definitively hers, was skin cells um, that matched Mr. Jenkins in four of the 13 areas that they looked for. And that frequency of a random person being, having that same uh, profile was one in 84,000 African Americans. Now, admittedly, that does not exclude the population of the earth as it would if all 13 areas matched and all 13 areas were capable of testing, but it also does not exclude Mr. Jenkins as being the contributor of the DNA that's in the sock. Now, it's been represented in the brief and it's, it hasn't quite been mentioned here at, at argument that it was only four of the 13 tested and it could be a matter of semantics, but it's a little bit of a misrepresentation because 13 areas were not tested because 13 areas were not available. And the 13 areas that are referenced are the chromosomal locations that the FBI has kind of identified as being the standard for human identification. But when you have a small sample or an old sample or a sample that's been degraded for whatever reason, they are sometimes not able to fully generate a profile in all 13 of those areas. And that's what happened in this case with reference to the sock. 
the chromosomal locations that were developed were these particular four. And the analyst testified that those four matched Mr. Jenkins in the same four areas. Can we call it a definitive match and exclude the entire population of the Earth? No, but one in 84,000 African Americans. So the question isn't whether it definitively identifies Mr. Jenkins as the perpetrator. The question is whether it casts doubt on the fact that he's already been found guilty by a jury of killing Ms. Williams. Now, in order to garner some kind of significance from the remaining DNA evidence, Mr. Jenkins puts forth a scenario that is simply not supported by the record, that Ms. Williams was sexually assaulted prior to her murder. There is the neighbor downstairs who testifies that she hears a screaming argument. Soon thereafter, hears someone run past her apartment and something hit the fence. Around the same time, Mr. Waldron testifies that he hears a woman scream and he comes out to investigate what happened. Eventually, he hooks up with Mr. Jenkins and they go to Ms. Williams' apartment and they see her lying there and she has been battered, obviously, but at this point she has not been stabbed in the chest as she will be later. There was no evidence that there was a sexual assault that occurred prior to her being murdered. There was no time for a sexual assault to occur. Her clothing was on her. It was nighttime. It was almost midnight, so she had a T-shirt and underwear on. There was no physical evidence at the autopsy of a sexual assault. It was not investigated as a sexual assault because there was no evidence of a sexual assault. The attack that happened in that apartment, the evidence was consistent with her running from her attacker and being stabbed in the back. There was no opportunity for a sexual assault to occur prior to this murder. So the fact that it wasn't investigated is because there was no evidence to support it. What was the state's theory as far as the motivation of Mr. Jenkins? The state was very candid in its opening statement that it did not have a motive to present to the jury at that point, but it did have eyewitness testimony from Mr. Waldron that he saw Mr. Jenkins standing over the victim with something shiny in her hand. And this is the second attack, mind you. So when Mr. Waldron first hears the scream, he goes out to investigate and he sees a black man jump over the fence that's kind of associated with Ms. Williams' apartment. There's a small fence and then there's a larger fence that surrounds the entire apartment complex, or at least it surrounds probably the vacant lot behind the apartment complex. So Mr. Waldron sees this black man jump over the small fence and he continues his investigation and then he comes upon Mr. Jenkins coming out of his apartment, which is near Ms. Williams' apartment, with a paper bag in his hand that looks like it contains some items. He says, did you hear these screams? And Mr. Jenkins says, yeah, I heard the woman scream. So he comes down his stairs and he says, watch my back, Mr. Jenkins says to Mr. Waldron. And he runs and he jumps over the fence into the empty lot and Mr. Waldron testifies he hears the bag hit the ground. Mr. Jenkins comes back over the fence, no longer has a bag in his hand. They then go and investigate the screams and they find Ms. Williams on her landing of her steps and at no point does Mr. Jenkins say, oh my gosh, Janet, what happened to you? Because he knows her. He doesn't say that. They go up, they see that she's injured. Mr. Waldron says, we need to call the police. Go call the police. Mr. Jenkins goes down the stairs, comes back a minute or two later and says, I don't have a gun. And then Mr. Waldron then leaves to call the police and when he's in his apartment calling the police or his wife is calling the police, he hears further screams and then he goes back out and that's when he says he sees Mr. Jenkins standing over the victim with something shiny in his hand. When he returns to the victim, she is now obviously stabbed in the chest, in the neck area, and she's bleeding out. So while Mr. Jenkins wants to present an alternative theory of what may have happened, that ship has sailed. He had his trial. A 3850 hearing is not an opportunity for post-conviction counsel to retry the case the way he or she would have liked to try it to begin with. The only thing that we look at for purposes of post-conviction DNA testing and the newly discovered evidence is what the newly discovered evidence is. The newly discovered evidence is the DNA evidence. It is the DNA evidence in the socks. It's the DNA evidence on the shoe that also includes Mr. Jenkins as a contributor. Some of that makes a lot of sense because he's apparently cradling or next to or standing in the pool of blood of the victim, right? 
I mean, it's explain some of it would be explainable that way at trial. Well, her, her DNA is certainly on those items, but his DNA or a profile that matches his DNA is on the wear area of the sock and on the right tennis shoe. Now, there's only a 1 in 300 frequency of the right tennis shoe, so it's, again, it's not definitive that it's Mr. Jenkins, but it doesn't exclude him either. And that's really what we're looking at. We need to look at this at the lens of does this, would this provide uh, an acquittal on retrial? So you have all the evidence that you've already presented at trial, including Mr. Waldron's testimony about seeing Mr. Jenkins standing over the victim with something shiny in his hand. And then you present to the jury, oh, and by the way, there's DNA in this sock that there is a statistical frequency that another individual would have the same DNA that matches Mr. Jenkins in 1 in 84,000 African Americans. That's not going to produce an acquittal at retrial. The, and the state's theory was that sock was covering the hand of the perpetrator. Correct. Correct. Now, there were two socks. The other sock, as I recall, didn't have any DNA uh, testable in it, but that was where the hairs were, which are, are completely irrelevant to this case because the state at trial never presented these hairs as being connected to this crime or in any other way indicative of the person who wore those socks as gloves. Um, and again, Mr. Jenkins wants this court to embrace the you know, results of the DNA testing of the biological material that doesn't have anything to do with the case, but ignore the testing of the biological material that has everything to do with this case, particularly the bloody sock. Now, they had an opportunity, and the post-conviction court was very generous in allowing Mr. Jenkins to put on a variety of evidence at this post-conviction hearing, but really, Dr. Vadden's testimony is not newly discovered evidence. Dr. Vadden's testimony is a contradictory opinion of an expert that is not an appropriate consideration for post-conviction. Did yeah. anything that the doctor testified to, and I guess I have to ask Ms. Palchak as well, but did anything the doctor testify to um, bring in any new scientific method or new testing method that would uh, might have changed the analysis um, had, had it existed back in? No, no. He testifies with reference to some of the sizes or the measurements on the stab wounds, um, and obviously he did not perform the autopsy, um, and he relies on, I'm presuming, on the, the reports and the photographs that were taken at the time. He also does not testify that Ms. Uh, Williams was sexually assaulted. He was asked, could she have been sexually assaulted? And he said yes, which ironically is what they are criticizing the detective for testifying to, which was, could she have been sexually assaulted? And he said, I can't rule it out, but there was no evidence to support it. Dr. Baden says, yeah, he could, she could have been sexually assaulted, but he did not testify within a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the mere presence of semen in the vagina indicates a sexual assault. And I can't imagine that any forensic pathologist who, you know, values their reputation would ever testify that there was a sexual assault based on the mere presence of uh, semen in the vagina. Um, the fact that Ms. Williams had a sexual encounter with another individual prior to being murdered does not necessarily lend um, any significance to another individual as being her murderer when you have all this evidence that points in the direction of Mr. Jenkins. And the, the post-conviction DNA testing didn't do anything to weaken the state's case, state's case against him, which it was Mr. Jenkins' burden to prove that it did. Significantly, not just, oh, well, if they had this evidence, they could have thought, you know, the police didn't do a thorough investigation, but that's not the standard. The standard is, would it produce an acquittal at retrial? And Mr. Jenkins wants to grab onto the language in Jones talking about the totality of the circumstance and, and the uh, full picture. And what Jones says is that you look at the newly discovered evidence in conjunction with the evidence presented at trial and any other newly discovered evidence from prior post-conviction hearings. We don't have any other newly discovered evidence. Merely putting witnesses on at a post-conviction hearing does not create newly discovered evidence. A newly discovered opinion or a newly discovered theory is not newly discovered evidence. Mr. Jenkins had a full and fair trial in 1990. He had a fair trial, he had a fair jury, he had a fair judge, he had adequate assistance of counsel. That has been confirmed by both state and federal courts. He had all the process he was due. The only hope he had was that this DNA evidence would exclude him or somehow um, exonerate him, and it does nothing but further implicate him in the brutal murder of Jeanette Williams. I understand um, that 
what Mr. Jenkins wants this court to do now is try his case over again. He has had his trial. He doesn't get another shot at it. He doesn't get another bite at the apple. He has gotten a post-conviction DNA testing motion granted. That testing was performed, and there is nothing in that testing that exonerates him or that would lead a reasonable jury to conclude that he did not commit this murder when you look at it in conjunction with the evidence that was presented to the jury back in 1990. This was a brutal murder. I will agree with counsel on that. This was not a situation that anybody would want to be in, frankly. Ms. Williams was brutally attacked in her apartment, and she survived that attack only to be once again presented with Mr. Jenkins, who is there to guard her body while Mr. Waldron goes to call the police. And she can't speak, and she can't talk, and she can't do anything to indicate that this is the person who savagely attacked me in my apartment. I survived that attack, and now Mr. Waldron goes walking down those stairs, and she's presented with Mr. Jenkins once again, who finishes the job he started in the apartment. There is nothing in this evidence that would indicate that Mr. Jenkins was wrongfully convicted of this murder. Mr. Jenkins should spend the rest of his life in prison. Ironically, he has an opportunity to take his chances with the parole board at this point based on the law that was in existence in 1990, but there is nothing that has been proven, and it was his burden to prove at the post-conviction hearing that would change that. Now, there's been some argument regarding these defensive wounds on Ms. Williams' hands. They were defensive wounds, and both Dr. Batten and the medical examiner back in 1990 testified that these defensive wounds consisted of stabbing on the fleshy part of her hand. She was trying to grab at the blade of the knife and prevent the knife from hitting her vital organs. She was not close enough to her attacker to scratch him. There is no indication that there was any kind of hand-to-hand combat as presented here today. She was trying to prevent herself from being stabbed. In the apartment, the evidence shows she was running from her attacker and being stabbed in the back. She was not scratching at anybody. If she was being pulled around by her curler, she was probably trying to keep her scalp to her skull as opposed to scratch and grab at her attacker. She really didn't have a chance in this case. I mean, she had an opportunity when she survived the attack at the apartment, and then she's left unwittingly by Mr. Waldron with her attacker once again, and he finishes the job. And just briefly, I want to address, too, the cross-racial identification issue, which wasn't argued significantly here, but just in case it's brought up, this, again, is not newly discovered evidence. These studies have been around for a long time. There's nothing new about them. It has picked up a lot of steam over the last two or three years. Sure, it has. And, you know, that's the nature of these kinds of studies. They develop over time, but they're not new. And additionally, they generally deal with stranger identification, cross-racial stranger identification, not identification of an individual that you just walked around with for a few minutes and you've had this experience of finding this woman who has been badly beaten, and then you see him minutes later. That's not the kind of cross-racial identification that they're concerned with. They're concerned with stranger identification. So in this particular case, even if you wanted to consider it newly discovered evidence, which the state completely disagrees that it is, it would not affect the identification that was had in this case by Mr. Waldron, who says, I saw Mr. Jenkins, this man, stand over the victim with something shiny in his hand, and the next thing I know, I go back to see her, and she is now bleeding out. You know, I appreciate that Mr. Jenkins has counsel who feels strongly about his case. He also had counsel that felt strongly about his case back in 1990. It's a testament to that counsel, I think, that he didn't get the death penalty in this case, and he was given a life sentence. There's been nothing presented to the post-conviction court, and there's been nothing presented to this court that will call into doubt Mr. Jenkins' conviction, and this court should affirm the denial of post-conviction relief. Thank you. Ms. Palachuk? Yes. A couple of things. First, on retrial, Mr. Waldron would have serious credibility issues. Some of those issues existed at the time. He was a many-time convicted felon, but Mr. Waldron is not the, and as this court has recognized, even when there's an identification made, identity of the suspect is still at issue. 
So it's not outside anything of this, that this court has done to reconsider despite witness testimony. The cross-racial identification has picked up steam in the recent years, and in fact, that was, I think, the number one mis witness misidentification was the, was the number one finding in the Innocence Commission recently put together at the Florida Supreme Court and that, that there's a significant problem with witness testimony. And this witness testimony was at 160 feet at nighttime. Miss uh, Williams' porch light was not on. So Mr. Mr. Uh, Waldron would be making this identification 160 feet at night where there's no light on that porch. In ter and, and in fact, I can supplement the record, although I believe that it's in there. Mr. When they found a toboggan inside the door of the apartment, a, a ski cap with the eye, eye holes cut out, which by the way were tested and had nothing, no DNA for Mr. Jenkins, uh, Mr. Waldron was asked by the police, was he wearing a ski mask? And he didn't know. He couldn't remember. And Mr. Jenkins, the state has made um, a, a, a lot from that Mr. Jenkins was allegedly seen carrying a brown paper bag down his steps, and that was the brown paper bag that contained these items. Mr. Waldron gave three different statements. He said that he saw Mr. Jenkins walk down his steps, he didn't have anything in his hand, or he saw someone else come down Ms. Uh, Williams' steps with something in his hand. Uh, there, so that's uh, unreliable, and, and it's true he was impeached about that during the trial, but, in the, but in, the, um, in the context of newly discovered DNA evidence, that bag was tested, no DNA for Mr. Jenkins. Now, uh, this, this, I, I, and, I, and actually, should this court not choose to, to, to reverse it through a de novo um, standard of review, I, 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 at the very least, this court must vacate and ask the trial court to engage in the appropriate analysis. The trial court did the vertical, like this piece of evidence wouldn't have led to a, uh, um, wouldn't, wouldn't have probably led to an acquittal, but actually it's the totality. The case never said all of these things combined wouldn't have led. They, it was point by point. It wasn't a sexual assault or it wasn't this. There was never the totality. And in fact, uh, Swafford and Hildwin talk about it's not just the evidence presented at trial that the court has to engage in um, you know, it could be this or it could be this, and it has to consider things from other post-conviction hearings. So I would argue that Dr. Bond's testimony would be, would be helpful and should be considered by this court because actually it was at a post-conviction hearing. Now, arguably, okay. We would ask this court to vacate, reverse and vacate either to send it back to the trial court to do an appropriate analysis, which wasn't done, or for this court to engage in a de novo review and look at the totality. He, there's, it's, the, it's the total picture under Swafford. It's the total picture under Hildwin. DNA evidence under the fingernails, on the hand with the defensive wounds, vaginal smear, not Mr. Jenkins, hair in a bloody sock, not Mr. Jenkins, that entirely excludes him. Just because there are minor loci and by the way, the state said it was 1 in 8,400. There's a plus or minus 10. That could be 1 in 840. And that brings us to the end of this Thank topic. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.